Just over half a century has passed since the end of one of the most gruesome series of murders to ever take place in the German Federal Republic. The small town of Langenberg, a medieval village preserved mostly intact, is located on the Dialbach Valley. It's surrounded by meadows, pastures, a stream and a forest. It's nothing to walk past an old air raid shelter on the Hegerstrasse without even noticing. Years ago, the entrance was closed over with concrete, but those who were around between 1962 and 1966 know that four of the most hideous, heinous and cruel murders in criminal history took place in that bunker. Not far from the Hegerstrasse air raid tunnel, there's a sign which reads 10-minute walk to House Senderblick restaurant. This is where a steep footpath ends which Jürgen Barsch would take on any night that he crept down the slope from where he lived with his parents to the scene of his crimes. Jürgen kept a set of clothes hidden in a concrete tube nearby which he would change into after he had snuck out of his basement bedroom window. Four boys aged between 8 and 13 years would become his victims. It was almost five, however, on June 18, 1966, Peter Frieser was able to free himself from where he'd been tied up and led police to the old air raid shelter. Leaving the boy alive was the killer's undoing. But what is it that led the 19-year-old, nicknamed the Fairground Killer, to commit these horrific murders? Overnight, Jürgen Barsch, someone unremarkable, almost invisible due to his long working days, very little free time, no social life or friends, became one of the most infamous people in German criminal history. Welcome to Veritas True Crime Podcast. Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Veritas True Crime Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse. Thanks very much for joining me. I want to give you a quick content warning here and now. This episode contains graphic details of child abuse, rape, murder and mutilation, masturbation and pedophilia. During my research, I found many facts which I decided to omit from the episode, mostly because they didn't have any effect on the continuity. However, I've shared an extensive amount of premium content, if you're interested, on Patreon. Part of my research for this case, and it was probably the most in-depth I've ever gone for a case before, included reading letters written by the subject over a number of years, and in German. I've translated quite a lot of the content for you to read through. Some of the details in the letters were musings from Jürgen, and I didn't feel that it was relevant. Some of the information was graphic details of his crimes, his miserable upbringing and life. I haven't censored any of the details. Some people may find the information triggering and confronting. So as always, discretion is advised. I had planned to drop hints through the podcast to let you know to fast forward sections, but as I went along, I felt that if I did that, it would take away from the story and I would spend too much time telling you to fast forward. If you feel like you'll be affected by any of the information in this episode, I suggest that you don't listen. I've edited the content in a way that we will jump around just a little bit. Some people might find this helpful if they want to skip over content that makes them feel uncomfortable. Feel free to have a look at the transcript on the show's website at veritastruecrime.com. Have you had a chance to visit me on Facebook yet? I'd love it if you'd stop by and click like on the page. Just search in Facebook for Veritas True Crime Podcast. Maybe you'd also like to leave a review if you've enjoyed listening to my episodes so far. By liking the page, you'll have access to reminders when there are new episodes, as well as seeing some additional content that doesn't make it on air. Photos from the cases that we're talking about and much more. I've mentioned it just before, but maybe you'd also like to visit my Patreon page for premium content. There's a poll on that page where you can vote for the kinds of true crime stories that you'd like me to tell you. There will be photos from crime scenes, extras from our stories, and soon I'll hold some live Q&As, like a meet and greet. I look forward to seeing you there. The link is on the episode page for Patreon. A quick little shout out to all of you in California and Texas. You were my top listeners this past month, and I just want you to know that I appreciate you, so thank you. 
I appreciate everyone who joins me for each episode on this strange little nerdy true crime journey that we're on, and I look forward to getting to know you all as we go. No matter where you are, I'm grateful that you've chosen my podcast to listen to today. Without further ado, let's talk about this week's case. Jürgen Bach, the Fairground Killer. Born Karl Heinz Sadrzinski on November 6, 1946, in post war Essen, West Germany, to Friedrich Sadrzinski and Elizabeth Anna Liedke. Friedrich worked in the mines. The couple lived in Essen on the Kattenberger Strasse, number 315. They were poor. Karl Heinz was separated from his mother immediately. She left the hospital and Karl Heinz behind. Just weeks later, she died from tuberculosis. There was no surrogate available for Karl Heinz, and he spent the first months of his life being looked after by nurses. It's unknown what happened to Karl Heinz's father. The municipal hospital had been largely destroyed during the recently ended World War II and was going to take years for reconstruction, so the nursery had been given a temporary home in the state insurance convalescent home. Although he was given protection, this environment did not nurture or offer him any love and care as a baby would get from their parents or a primary reference person like a mother or father. One of the nurses, Annie, looked after Karl Heinz, was still working at the hospital in the 1970s. During an interview with Jürgen's biographer, she described him as a ray of sunshine. She said he had dark hair, full lips and dark eyes that beamed at her whenever she would enter the room. He was, according to her, always blissful. She said that all of the nurses were in love with him and there was a lady, Mrs. Bash, who would come by and check on him once a week. He was already six months old when Annie started working at the hospital in the nursery. It was later during psychiatric assessment and even after his death that experts say this upbringing in those first months was the basis of his sadistic personality. Gerhard and Gertrude Barsch, a wealthy, self-made couple, had been coming to the hospital in search of a baby to adopt. They'd paid the nursery extra to keep him there to avoid the authorities placing him in an orphanage. Gertrude was particularly concerned with Karl Heinz's welfare and what would happen to him if he had left. When they first met Karl Heinz, they found him to be charming and immediately decided that they would adopt him into their family. The authorities were making life difficult for Gerhard and Gertrude to adopt Karl Heinz because of concern about where he had come from. Nurse Annie said that Karl Heinz was believed to have been born out of wedlock, just like his mother had been. The father was apparently unknown. It only took me a little bit of research for me to find the marriage record of his parents and the birth certificate which has both parents' names on it. They were married in 1943 in Essen. Gerhard and Gertrude Barsch had been longing to adopt a child, particularly Gerhard who was hoping for a boy who would follow in his footsteps and work in the butcher shop business on the Gutestrasse. Later he was always trying to make a real man out of him. After the war, Gerhard had gone to Denmark and returned to Germany with a small pair of patent leather shoes. Gertrude was described as completely overprotective and emotionally withdrawn by Jürgen's German-American journalist friend, Paul Moore. Paul is the author of Jürgen Barsch's Self-Portrait of a Child Murderer book. Gertrude had met Karl Heinz because she'd been in the hospital for a total hysterectomy. Psychoanalyst Renee A. Spitz has written extensively about children left in hospitals and says that they develop faster than other children and are more social. This certainly attracted Gertrude and Gerhard Barsch to the young boy. Finally, in 1947, when Karl Heinz was 11 months old, he finally went to live with Gertrude and Gerhard. He would now be known as Jürgen Barsch. The house where the Barsch family lived was on a steep hill in the Glubenen Tat settlement near Langenberg. Unfortunately, to those who knew her, Gertrude was known as the Cleaning Devil. And although Jürgen had been potty trained at this point, the trauma of being taken from the only home he had ever known, adjusting to a new surroundings, he started to wet and soil himself again. This disgusted Gertrude. 
It was around this time that acquaintances of the Bash family began to notice bruises on the babies. Gertrude always had a new story for the Marks. People, however, were not convinced. It was also recorded that at one time, a heavily depressed Gerhard Bash confessed to a friend that he was considering a divorce from Gertrude, saying, she beats the child so much, I just can't take it anymore. There was another incident where Gerhard was leaving his friend in a hurry and said, I have to go home or she will kill my child. Gertrude and Gerhard would often argue. Gertrude was quite an abusive person toward her husband as well as to Jürgen. During his trial, Jürgen said that they would often yell and scream at each other and his mother had once contemplated divorcing his father as well. She'd even gone as far as consulting a lawyer about what her options were. Gerhard would often sit on the bed and cry. He described his mother as overweight and very, very clean obsessed. She would often throw things. In the book General Criminology by Anna Ava Brownick, she writes, In all probability, the boy was already impaired in his capacity for bonding when he was given the opportunity for a stable human relationship for the first time at 11 months. At the very least, this last change must have disturbed him. To develop his ability to bond, he would have needed an extraordinarily warm-hearted and generous mother, instead of the narrow-minded woman like Mrs. Barsh, who was no longer young, had never had children of her own, considered herself fond of children because she had fallen in love with an angel and suffered a severe shock when he revealed himself to be a small human animal with a vigorously active abdomen. This experience was probably a real threat to Mrs. Barsh. Jürgen wrote in letters on more than one occasion that no matter what they did to him, no matter how they didn't show it, he knew that his parents loved him. Between 1968 and 1976, Paul, Moore and Jürgen had written letters to each other. In those letters, Jürgen gave insights into his catastrophic childhood. Behind the facade of the pretty family picture shown to the world from the butcher shop, his life and his inner feelings. One of Jürgen's lawyers, Muller, had told him that Paul was psychoanalytically trained and a professional, but Paul corrected that mistake. Obviously, this didn't bother Jürgen because they continued to write and they sent more than 250 letters to each other over those years. The very first letter that Jürgen sent to Paul Moore was dated 23rd of January 1968. This is how it reads. Dear Mr. Moore, First of all, my heartfelt thanks for your dear card on January 9th, 1968, and also for the Christmas telegram of December 24th, 1967, which made me very happy. I didn't feel much of Christmas and New Year's this year, and even if I had wanted to, I wouldn't have been able to write a letter at that time. I haven't really recovered to this day. Why? I want to describe it to you, not to arouse sympathy, but because it may be of interest to you since you've been trained psychoanalytically, as Herr Moller has told me. My biggest mistake was probably summoning up all my strength during the whole trial in order to be able to hold out at all costs. And I was repeatedly told that I had unbelievable staying power, but that was entirely true. It was just the iron will that made me endure everything for so long. That's probably why the picture of the callous, ice-cold Jürgen Barsch, who actually had every effort not to fall over, came about. I only realised too late, as is always the case, that I had not survived the whole thing physically and mentally without damage. Namely, on the evening of December 15, that was the last day of his trial, I suddenly had the feeling that I couldn't breathe, and that I would suffocate. When it became unbearable, I asked for a doctor, which I had never done before. A paramedic came, Herr Schulz, who I got along with very well. He noticed that I had a very high heart rate, probably because of fear, and was there twice more during the night. However, the shortness of breath persisted, although I was too stupid to call for the doctor again in the next few days. Jürgen's adoptive parents strictly forbade friends and family who knew that he was adopted from telling Jürgen that he wasn't their biological child. He wasn't allowed to play with other children because his mother was afraid that he would get dirty. She was so fixated on cleanliness, a symptom of her obsessive compulsive disorder, that Gertrude demanded everything be clean and tidy in the home. Jürgen was completely under her control. Clothes were required to be folded and placed on shelves with military precision. 
She would choose his clothes for him to wear daily, right up until...